Today, I'm going to be sharing five lessons that the ancient Japanese art of Kintsugi can teach adult survivors recovering from family scapegoating abuse. That's what I'll be talking about in today's episode of Beyond Family Scapegoating Abuse. So stick around. Welcome to my channel. I'm Rebecca Mandeville, licensed psychotherapist, certified complex trauma treatment professional, and the author of Rejected, Shamed, and Blamed. One of my favorite quotes from a, a musician or poet is a quote from Leonard Cohen. And he once said in a song, there is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. I like to share that quote with clients coming to me for help in my FSA recovery coaching practice. And I also like to share the analogy of the Kintsugi vase. And that's what I'd like to share with you all today. Kintsugi is not just an art form. Some of you may already know what Kintsugi is. If you've seen vases with cracks that are filled in with precious metals, gold, platinum, uh, silver, that is the art of Kintsugi. But Kintsugi is also a philosophy, and some people aren't aware of that. And it's the philosophy of Kintsugi that I think makes a wonderful analogy for healing from abuse and trauma and specifically for the purposes of today's video from family scapegoating abuse. The Kintsugi artist takes shattered vessels, these vases, and accentuates the cracks, does not hide them, and uses precious materials, as I mentioned, to fill in the cracks. Let me show you a couple of examples here. Instead of concealing our scars, these invisible scars caused by psycho-emotional trauma and abuse, we display them as things of beauty. No need anymore to feel any type of shame about what we've gone through. And we are also acknowledging our inner strength because where these cracks have been filled in with these precious materials, the vase is stronger for it. The philosophy of the Kintsugi honors the history of the vase, of the material that's being worked with. There is endurance within every fracture. We too, as adult survivors of FSA, can honor what we have endured and all that we've been through, the stories that are etched into our being, into our soul through our experiences, both the challenging ones and the transformative ones. As I often say to my clients, my philosophy as a therapist and as a trauma-informed coach is that clients come to me, I help them expand their awareness. And then the coaching aspect, which is really critical, um, and therapists are wise to apply a bit of coaching in their therapy practices, we need to help the clients, adult survivors such as yourself, to integrate those new awarenesses into your everyday ordinary life. It's great to sit once a week and get all these awarenesses, but if it's not being applied to your actual life, there is not going to be any transformation whatsoever. So the three pillars for my work with clients and my philosophy as a psycho-spiritual, transpersonally oriented therapist and coach and educator is awareness, integration, and transformation. 
similar to this ancient art and practice of Kintsugi, healing from the deep intrapsychic wounds of FSA follows a similar path of transformation. It involves bravely acknowledging past hurts and abuses and injustices, embracing vulnerability as a strength rather than a weakness, and ultimately turning pain into resilience. I found as both a clinician coach and as an adult survivor of FSA myself, that drawing comparisons between the philosophy of Kintsugi and the journey towards healing is a means whereby we can uncover profound insights into the restorative abilities of self-care, self-compassion, self-nurturance, self-love in navigating through and transcending trauma. I'd now like to share with you all five lessons that I've identified that the philosophy and art of Kintsugi can teach adult survivors of family scapegoating abuse. The first lesson, embracing imperfection. Kintsugi teaches us to embrace imperfections and accept imperfections as part of life's journey. I don't have to tell you that individuals struggling with symptoms and the effects of family scapegoating abuse and complex trauma, betrayal trauma, struggle with feelings of inadequacy and self-blame. We've gone through life being invalidated. Many of us experience traumatic invalidation and toxic shame which I discuss in my book, Rejected, Shamed, and Blamed, recognizing that all of these different issues you may be struggling with that other people may not understand and may view as imperfections, defects, or character faults, or whatever you want to call them, this does not diminish your self-worth, not at all. I talk about radical acceptance in my articles, my book, and videos here, and radically accepting our our splits and our cracks and our wounds and our scars is an act of self-compassion and self-love. So anytime you're feeling broken or beyond repair, I'd like you to think of these images of the Kintsugi vase that I just showed you, these beautiful, beautiful vases with these gleaming cracks that proudly display where the cracks are. There's no need to hide that you have been wounded by invisible abuse, these types of abuse that can be so insidious and subtle in families. Instead, once you have the awareness that that is what happened to you, you can just wear your scars as a symbol of your resilience, a symbol of your strength and of your beauty. Lesson number two, transforming pain into beauty. Healing from any type of abuse or trauma isn't about erasing these invisible wounds, these invisible scars. It's about embracing them. If you're an adult survivor of FSA, you may have gone through your entire life feeling that you're somehow defective, that something's wrong with you. You may have been directly told, including by parents or siblings, that there's something wrong with you. And so as we move deeper into recovery and learn we have complex trauma, we may have that, we may have betrayal trauma, all types of psycho-emotional effects from being in the family scapegoat role. Uh, there is that danger of then feeling overwhelmed that there's so much wrong with you. And I like to help my clients understand that there's nothing at all wrong with them. And in fact, what I say is that I see them in their wholeness and I will be a mirror and reflect that wholeness to them until they can experience it within themselves. The Kintsugi vase may have cracks, but these are beautiful cracks and it's still a vase. It's still a vessel. It can still function as a vessel. It can still hold water. It can hold flowers. You're not broken because you have 
intrapsychic wounding because you have these invisible wounds and scars. It's especially important to remember that any type of healing is not a linear process. It's a winding, meandering process at times. You can feel you've made progress and then feel you've gone way, way backwards, especially if you are still choosing to be in contact with family and you have a family visit, as I mentioned in the last video, and you regress emotionally, feel like you're three years old, and you may feel like you have no recovery whatsoever. It's not true. You are on a journey that is more of a spiral with periods of moving up and periods of feeling like you're moving down. But the main thing is, are you expanding your awareness? If you think of the egoic consciousness as being in the middle of three parts, shall we say, and you have a higher unconsciousness, which would be your peak experiences, joy-filled experiences, and a lower unconsciousness that's darkness, despair, dark night of the soul. When someone comes into me, I am seeking to help them expand their awareness. And that means they're going to become aware of painful things, perhaps memories or things they didn't realize what happened to them and their family. Or they read my book and go, oh my God, that's me. I, I didn't know that's what happened to me. But you're also going to expand into the light so to speak. And that's why I like to use for my badges here, loyalty badges on YouTube, wings. We're not doing a bypass, so to speak, what we call in the transpersonal field, the spiritual bypass, where we just magically are all better. We've transcended everything. And our childhood's not a problem. We might throw ourselves into activities or groups, um, but we don't do the work. We don't move through the pain. We don't process the pain. That will not get you very far in the end. It takes courage to dig into the deep, so to speak, to go down into what lies beneath. And ideally, you would do so with a skilled trauma-informed therapist. And if you can't, then do try to find different types of support. I do have a resource list that has some possible support avenues there linked on that page. I share it with a lot of you here. It's on my website at scapegoatrecovery.com as well. So don't hesitate to check that out. And uh, there's many types of support beyond what I offer here. I list many possible healing avenues for FSA in my book. And it is important at times to have a guide who can not do the work for you, but maybe they're carrying a lantern to help you see. And maybe they can point and say uh, the end of the tunnel's there and that's where we're headed. But only you can make that journey. It is a one person job in the end to heal from family scapegoating abuse or any type of abuse that you've experienced in your life. As your sense of self, your self-identity grows, as you start to shed what I call the scapegoat narrative you've been maybe saddled with for much of your life, your true self nature, your wholeness, your beauty will shine through these cracks and you too will be like that beautiful Kintsugi vase, that work of art embracing the cracks, not erasing them. Lesson number three, honoring your history and your heritage. That might seem like a tall order for many of you if you have suffered abuse in your family. But what I know as a family systems specialist, uh, someone who was trained by some of the best in the world, I was fortunate to be trained by the chair of my master's if, uh, in counseling psychology program. When she was young, she interned with three of the founders of the family systems field uh, over 50, 60 years ago when the field was founded, Virginia Satir, Marie Bowen, who, whose work I reference in my book, Salvador Mnuchin. So I got it, you know, from their mouth to hers to mine. 
And I love talking about family systems. And I also really encourage my clients and all of you here to not throw out the baby with the bathwater. There may be aspects of your family, your family system, your lineage, you can feel proud of that uh, shows that the people that you come from have resilience. There may be great deal of trauma in your family. So sometimes we can open our hearts up to what some of our family members or our ancestors may have experienced through immigration, genocide, um, uh, diseases that swept through influenza and knocked out uh, infants and children. I think with one, um, one such event, my great grandparents lost seven children in the course of 10 days. My grandfather was the uh, child born after all those losses. So that's a lot to carry to be the only child after so many uh, losses that his parents experienced, seven dead children. So to become curious, I often invite my clients to do a family genogram. It's kind of a heavy, intensive process. Not too many take me up on it, but it's certainly worth looking into. There's workbooks you can find on Amazon. And this is where we look for emotional uh, patterns, behavioral patterns, and when you lay it all out, um, including traumas, um, losses, disappearing family members, uh, like I mentioned in the article I put last week, and my dad just disappeared. No one knew if he was alive or dead for 35 years until I found him. It gives you more understanding of not excusing the behaviors that harmed you, but more understanding of how that big ball of wax or it looks in my mind, more like a tumbleweed, how that started rolling down the hill and got bigger and bigger and bigger until it landed on you. So this is, again, similar to the philosophy and art of Kintsugi because the past of that vase with all those cracks is incorporated into its transformation into a beautiful work of art. Be curious about your family system. If you're still in touch with family and it's safe for you to be, at family gatherings, if you're not too emotionally activated, especially those of you with complex trauma, you know, find one of the elderly family members and see if you can can learn some things you didn't know. They often are the history keepers, and they often, um, no matter how they may act otherwise, often love sharing family history. And once they're gone, sometimes that that history is gone with them. It's also interesting to sit in a different place where you normally don't sit. That breaks the homeostasis at the holiday uh, dinner table. <laughs> That's an interesting experiment my clients have fun doing. But also you may sit next to someone you don't talk too much. Another great way to get some history from a cousin or an aunt. So these are just uh, ideas that I like to give to my clients and pass on to you that we do have very complex family systems. Individuals are also very complex and complicated. And that's why I try to avoid these cookie cutter videos where someone's always this or not always that. I, I do simplify at times because there are new people here and family systems is very new to them. Lesson number four, finding strength in vulnerability just as embracing vulnerability, embracing these cracks in the vase in this art of Kintsugi is a critical aspect of how the artist makes the vase more exquisite and beautiful than before. So too, in healing from family scapegoating abuse, our vulnerability becomes a source of immense strength that can feel like a hard one to wrap your mind around if your vulnerability was used against you, especially those of you out there who identify as being empaths. But it's a different way to think about vulnerability, that your vulnerability, your transparency is in fact your protection. It's, uh, it's paradoxical. I know this weekend when I exposed a bit more about myself and my background, I did feel strong I did feel strong when I hit that publish button and I could tell I've come a long way. 
and I can be more open. I can be more transparent with uh, my blog audience and with my YouTube audience. And I don't need to be afraid. My openness is my protection. I don't need to hide behind a clinical mask as much as I might have done when I was first starting this channel. Reaching out for support, talking to others, taking a chance, maybe looking up one of the forums and support groups that I put on that resource list that I pass out to many of you. Taking those kinds of risks is a courageous step towards healing from this form of abuse because there's so much shame that often many of us are unconsciously carrying this traumatic shame, toxic shame. And it keeps us very, very isolated where we become afraid to reach out. We, uh, we've we learned for decades, for some of us, I have a lot of older people here, I'm one of them. And we, we learned over, uh, decades and decades that we weren't going to be believed or we were going to be called emotionally ill or crazy or mentally ill if we ever tried to share some of these dynamics we were experiencing. Why would we join a group or reach out or trust that anyone is going to believe or understand us? Um, but there are places where you will be believed. I hope this place is one of them. It's not the only place, but I hope that this will be one of the places you do feel believed and none of us are perfect here um i do like to give a friendly reminder to please be kind when you're chatting with each other here in the comments because we are all so vulnerable and one person's bad experience on a site like mine or a forum they may never go back i remember a professor um before i started teaching grad school myself i'll never forget it he said rebecca that first session that client has with you, if they're not feeling like you're seeing them, hearing them and connecting with them and that you're going to help them, if you don't make it clear in that first session, you really believe you can help them, they might not come back and they might not ever go out to try again with someone else. It's a sacred obligation. It's a sacred responsibility to try to make that connection. I know how vulnerable you all are. I wish I could answer every comment. We're almost at 20,000 subscribers. And I still am trying to answer every comment myself. And I know it's not going to be possible. I feel sad about that. Um, but I, I still do try to capture the most distressed comments and at least hand out my resource list if that's all I can do. But know that I do know there's so many of you here who are vulnerable. And I also know that that vulnerability can turn into your greatest strength. As my old uh, Tai Chi teacher once said, and I've said it here before, believe nothing, entertain possibilities. Lesson five, cultivate resilience, self-compassion, and self-love. This lesson really incorporates the four preceding lessons, embracing imperfections, honoring your past experiences, honoring your history, finding strength in your vulnerability. These are all ways that we can develop self-compassion, self-love, and recognize our own resilience. The Kintsugi vase, by the time it's finished, is a one of a kind masterpiece. There's no vase that's going to look quite like it. No vase is going to have the exact same cracks. The artist who created the vase is going to address the cracks in their own unique way. So no Kintsugi vase is identical to another. And that is true for each of you. What your healing looks like ultimately, and it is a journey. I'm not sure there's ever a, you know, dot the I, cross the T, okay, now I'm done healing from family scapegoating abuse. I just, I personally don't experience it that way. I don't see it that way. But there can be a lessening of this heavy, heavy intrapsychic weight. The despair can lift. 
hope can grow, moments of joy become possible, a sense of self-love can start to grow, a sense of radical acceptance regarding what happened to you and radically accepting yourself with all of your, your imperfections and cracks can also grow. Your inner beauty that was always there can shine brightly through the cracks like gold. The pathway that I use in my FSA recovering coaching practice that's been very helpful for my clients is first they read my book, often that's how they find me. And then I take them at this time because I don't have my own workbook yet. I've had several publishers ask me to do a workbook and I wish there were 10 of me. Uh, and I do plan to do one one day, but I have been very fortunate uh, because Dr. Janina Fisher published a workbook a couple of years after my book came out, and that's the one I use with my clients. It's on my uh, bookstore on my website, scapegoatrecovery.com forward slash shop, and that is Transforming the Living Legacy of Trauma. It will help you know if you may be experiencing complex trauma symptoms, and it helps to address complex trauma symptoms in a manner that's trauma-informed, meaning we don't go up and try to drag up all the old material, all the painful material. It is a very gentle way of working with clients. It's very effective. And in fact, it is through Dr. Janina Fisher that I have my certification as a complex trauma treatment professional. So for those of you therapists out there, I know I have a lot of therapists and clinicians on this channel. It's a great program, a uh, certification program, and you may wanna check that out if you'd like to work with abuse survivors in your practice. Once I'm done with Dr. Fisher's workbook, I invite my clients to use a workbook by Dr. Kristen Neff, N-E-F-F, -F, and Dr. Christopher Germer, G-E-R-M-E-R, -E -E also on my bookshop on my website, the Mindful Self-Compassion Workbook. And I know I have a lot of Christians here also on this channel. I've worked with Christian clients with this workbook. You can kind of just adjust things if anything doesn't feel quite right to you. But if any of you know of a good self-compassion workbook for Christians, I'm happy to put that on my bookstore as well. Just drop that in the comments and I'll do so. We know that trauma is held in the body. I, it cannot be addressed solely through talk therapy. Uh, it is very helpful to use trauma-informed practices in your recovery process. Some of you may have post-traumatic stress disorder as well as complex trauma, and there are differences there. These are things I get into in my book when I talk about the different pathways you can use and also uh, how to find a therapist who can understand healing from family abuse, from psycho-emotional abuse and trauma. I have not yet done my own certification program, so those of you who write saying, where can I find an FSA trained therapist? I am hoping to start a certification program for therapists, and when I get that going, I will make an announcement about that. I just have a lot on my plate at this time, both personally and professionally. So some of these things I'm having to push off and uh, we'll get to down the line. But suffice it to say that daily practices that nourish your heart, your mind, your body, your soul, whether that's just sitting uh, out on a deck you might have with a cup of tea and looking at birds or taking a walk, getting around nature is so restorative and getting around animals for many of us having animals is so restorative and and so healing whatever you do to have community to be able to find people that can hear you value you respect you hobbies activities getting your mind completely off healing and recovery stuff for a while. I, I always, actually, I take breaks to take care of myself, but I think it's great for therapists uh, to invite their clients to take breaks because um, we can get so, so uh, into our recovery and so in looking within that we can get caught there. Uh, I use the analogy of an ingrown toenail. We're going in so much that it can become a little infected. <laughs> We need to clean it out, give ourselves a break, and then come back to therapy 
proper coaching, trauma-informed coaching, refresh. So do take a break from these things. Read a book that has nothing to do with recovery. Watch a, a television show that has nothing to do with healing or recovery or intense issues and try to integrate such practices into your life every day. I keep lavender oil spray near my bed. It's such a little thing, but you know, I spray that in the morning and the evening. It's just a, a reminder for me to do self care for the day. And I love the smell of lavender and it's calming and soothing. So that's part of my self care practice. It can be something as simple as that. These types of practices are a way of saying to yourself, I deserve nurturing. I deserve to take care of myself. I deserve love. And you all do deserve love. And I hope that today's video on how the Kintsugi vase, the art and philosophy of the Kintsugi vase has inspired you in regard to your own healing and that you can incorporate these five lessons in your own daily practices. I look forward as always to hearing from you in the comments and do remember in our membership area on the membership tab, I'm posting an affirmation, an FSA recovery affirmation every Monday morning. So do check out my membership offerings by clicking on the white join button underneath the video. And I'll see you next time. Take care.